Thank you all very much to those of you here in the audience in Washington, D.C., and the many people online. We appreciate your participation in this important conversation. Uh, this morning, in a lot of the discussions, we heard the word leadership raised uh, is an important dimension in this conversation, and we're going to continue that in a very focused way with this panel. I should mention, uh, just for some background, that I began my career as an admissions person in the state of Washington and became the admissions director for the first time at a university about six months after Initiative 200 passed in the state of Washington that banned the use of race and ethnicity in admissions, and then later moved in as, as an associate vice president to one of the California State University institutions. So I spent my entire career in public admissions in states where the consideration of race and ethnicity was not uh, allowed. Uh, and now as an association member, when I talk to my colleagues, we have the opportunity to see many presentations from institutions that have done very good work in defining their goals for access and opportunity and diversity and making progress to those goals. And when you ask them, my, my colleagues, what, what is an essential element in your success? And in every conversation, it is support from the top. Uh, these, these initiatives on our campuses require resources, they require commitment, money, changes in perspective, willingness to push back on detractors, and oh yes, there, there will be detractors uh, when you try to do these initiatives. So we'd like to focus on the issue of leadership, and I think you'll concur that we've assembled a panel here that is leadership with a large L, I would say. Um, very pleased to have on our panel, you can see more in your program uh, on their background, but Bernie Machin, former president, of the University of Florida, uh, Richard McCormick, President Emeritus from Rutgers University, and if I may, also formerly the President of the University of Washington when I was in the state of Washington. Uh, we have Jeremiah Quinlan, who is the Dean of Undergraduate Admissions at Yale University, and finally, Molly Corbett Broad, currently the President of the American Council on Education and of many other former leadership opportunities, the former President of the University of North Carolina System. Welcome to all of you as we have this discussion. I'd like to start a little more generally before we get into the questions of the use of race and ethnicity and admissions. And, and Dick, start with you, just ask the question, and the rest of you please follow. What are the greatest challenges and opportunities that leaders or even higher education more broadly faces in terms of providing access and educating a diverse American citizenry? Sure, Mike, thanks. I'll, uh, I think I'll interpret that by focusing first on the challenges knowing that all of us will turn to strategies that work, in, uh, in other words, the opportunities we have. So everyone who has spoken today and everyone who will speak believes in the importance of racial and economic diversity in higher education. And this is so for two vital reasons. I realize for, at this juncture I'm speaking to the choir or singing to the choir, permit me to do it. There are two reasons we do economic and racial diversity. One is social justice. It's just not right that someone should be deprived of an opportunity to get an education because of who they are or their background or their family circumstances or who their mom and dad are. And the second reason, and a lot of research supports this, that we do diversity is uh, educational excellence. Myriad studies show that everybody, not just kids of color, everybody gets a better education in a diverse environment when you learn and work and study with people who are not just like you, you're ready or for the heterogeneous global 21st century. If I may say so, these goals of diversity are especially important for selective institutions, both public and private, where despite decades of effort, including at the institutions with which I've been associated, affluent white students, on the whole among selective institutions, affluent white students are still way overrepresented. Yet if anything, if anything at this juncture, the difficulties of recruiting and educating poor students and students of color are increasing rather than decreasing. Why is that so? Well, perhaps the most important factor is the decline of governmental, specifically state support for education. Uh, the, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, at a typical state university like the ones with which I was associated, uh, the state paid about two-thirds of the cost of the education, leaving around one-third to the students and their families. Now it's just about the reverse. Uh, tuition uh, uh, has to cover about two-thirds because the state is only picking up around one-third. Those numbers will vary from institution to institution, but the general pattern does, does not. Um, so you have, as a result, high tuition, and you have increasing student debt. 
behind those transformations, decline of state support, increase of tuition, increase of student debt, lies what I would call a fateful change in the way Americans have looked at higher education. My parents' generation, in the aftermath of World War II, firmly believed that higher education was a public good, that the whole society is better when people get a college education, and therefore it's worth societal, that, that is to say governmental taxation. Uh, investments in uh, in higher education. Now that the worm has kind of turned and the feeling is that the benefits accrue almost exclusively to the individuals who get the degrees and therefore they should pay. It's a fateful, that's a fateful change. So uh, it's made particularly difficult for people from disadvantaged economic backgrounds. And it should be pointed out, every, every racial and ethnic group includes people from disadvantaged economic backgrounds, includes poor people, but not in, equal, not in equal proportions. And so the high cost of college attendance deters relatively more minority students than it does white students. Sadly, too, our big urban, I'm laying out the challenges, so bear with me. Sadly, too, our big urban school districts, which mostly educate African American and Hispanic kids, are not very good, and the educations that kids receive there don't prepare them for college nearly as well as the education that affluent white kids receive in the suburbs. Most students who are trapped in big city schools would not be ready for college, even if college was ready and affordable for them. As a result, as Anthony Carnevale and Jeff Stroll have shown, the great majority of minority college students attend community colleges and poorly funded open access four-year institutions where graduation rates, job prospects, even health and longevity are, are lower than at selective institutions. So with respect to the challenges, I'm wrapping up now. So many of our current trends are converging to discourage minority enrollment in selective colleges and universities, and those convergent trends define the challenges that we face. I and others on the panel fortunately will have more to say as our discussion goes on about some of the successful strategies for addressing these perilous circumstances. Fortunately, with hard work and the investment of money, there are such strategies. Thank you. Any other comments on the broader question of challenges as we move forward? You know, I think uh, it's important for us to acknowledge the values that are the foundation of American higher education, uh, opportunity and access. And this is not the values of every kind of higher education around the world. It is in many ways uh, sets the United States commitment uh, apart from other nations and other uh, institutions of higher education. I mean, we, and, and I think somehow we don't acknowledge this as openly as we ought to because it is one of the most important foundations for our commitment to uh, diversity. I mean, we believe in academic freedom. Uh, we believe in institutional autonomy. Not every nation feels that way. I, I recall being engaged in a conversation uh, with a uh, minister of education from Eastern Europe. And when I laid this out, he said, oh, this is not what we do. We consider our university to be an instrument of the state, and they do what we tell them um, to do. So when we look at the circumstances we find ourselves in today, and as just been uh, mentioned, we have a growing proportion of the population who are not getting opportunity for higher education. And um, if you have read Bob Putnam's new book about our kids, it is very discouraging to see the percentage of young people who have the full capacity to benefit from a higher education that are not finding their way to a college or university. So I need to add a couple more challenges to the uh, conversation today. First of all, this entire audience, as Dick said, is committed to the role of diversity and convinced of its value in higher education. I must tell you that I sense that that commitment is not as strong everywhere as it used to be. 
At public institutions, different kinds of people are being appointed to governing boards. I think that when you talk to the public at large and access is uh, sometimes put against um, diversity, it comes off second. So we need not only to us choir members, but we need to make sure that the commitment to diversity remains strong. And secondly, I'm very concerned about the lack of emphasis on need-based financial aid in our country today. The attacks on Pell Grants ought to be the first red light you see, but for uh, lots of interesting reasons, many states are not putting money into need-based financial aid. And that, in my opinion, as we will talk more, is the ultimate key to making this thing work. And then even just building off of the public commitment to need-based financial aid, I think the move amongst private institutions as well to allocate more of their aid resources to uh, merit aid versus need is another huge challenge um, in pursuit of uh, you know, higher test scores and greater US News and World Report rankings, um, the sort of misallocation or the new reallocation of the financial aid dollars that institutions are giving out there is incredibly overlooked. And I think one of the drivers behind some of the disparities that are pointed out in uh, you know, Anthony Carnavale's work. Um, the other thing I would just say is it's, it is a real challenge for us as institutions to not be able to use that social justice prong um, that President McCormick just sort of talked about because of the really relevant discussions in society and that our campuses want to have that we're seeing with recent events about the social justice uh, issues that are headline news. Um, and there's nothing like being in the admissions committee room for six straight weeks looking at the 30,000 applications from your institution to really highlight some of those disparities as we go through in our march through the applicants from this country. It is incredibly uh, highlighted and stark those types of differences and the need to be able to address some of the social justice issues, not only from an admissions perspective, but also on our campus. So this morning we saw in the report some pretty large distinctions between the impacts of Supreme Court decisions on practice and the impacts of statewide bans on practice, pretty markedly uh, stark differences. And we are fortunate that our panelists here are, have these experiences where uh, the bans have taken place in their state or there were very concerted efforts to implement those bans that they failed. Can, Maybe start, Bernie, by talking about your perspective from Florida. How have these experiences impacted your commitment to the principle that the consideration of race and ethnicity can have its place in college admissions? So the, to, to make sure your commitment is solid, if you can do it, you need to start with the institution's mission statement. How many of you have taken a look to see if diversity is in there? If you can get it in there, great. If you can't, you need to make sure that your leadership is solidly behind that. And then I think today's report from the uh, research group about the findings of what's actually being done is really quite helpful. It's the first time I've seen some kind of quantitative uh, delineation of the strategies that are at work out there. We need to use all those. And the one that I had to add that really wasn't on the table was financial aid. We discovered at a very highly selective state university that we had plenty of applicants that were accepted without affirmative action. Remember, we haven't had affirmative action in admissions for 15 years. And our numbers uh, I can tell you about them later, but the, the, when we started looking at the strategies in play, which the report talked about this morning, we found we weren't getting there. So we went back over our data and we realized there are a lot more people admitted that weren't coming. And when we queried them, it was about financial aid. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, states are not exactly jumping into the ball game of need-based financial aid. So we set up our own scholarship program. 
we currently raise over $12 million a year just for the scholarship program, and it's had a market effect on our diversity as we define it here today. Molly, you had a very different uh, experience, but experienced a very concerted effort to implement the ban on the use of race and ethnicity in your state. Talk about that experience and how that might have changed your perspective. So shortly after I arrived as president of the University of North Carolina, uh, Ward Connerly was visiting our state um, in the aftermath of uh, his perceived success in, in California. And at the same time, I, I'd have to acknowledge that the University of North Carolina has been a great institution for more than 200 years. But it was not serving the full array of students. And with the rapid growth in population in North Carolina, we were really looking at a circumstance that required us to take some steps that would open up the doors of opportunity for students who lived in rural parts of the country, persons of color, low-income uh, families. And we finessed Ward Connerly by reaching out into the communities and laying out strategies that opened up opportunities for students that otherwise would not have had a chance for higher education. So I, I think when you're committed to these values and if you are strategic in you, your thinking and you are flexible in the development of strategies, you can accomplish these goals without confronting uh, award counterly. Now, Dick, back to the state of Washington, again, where we had a little bit of common experience, but of course yours was through the lens of the University of Washington, which is the flagship institution that had done a very good job of uh, establishing a diverse student body and then was confronted with this uh, initiative. So talk about that experience and how sure. you followed uh, up on that. As you said, and long before I got to the University of Washington, it had done a good job of creating a diverse student body. And then along came Ward Connolly uh, to our state in 1998, uh, two years after he had been to California. Uh, and in fact, through his efforts and the effective, if, if in my opinion, misguided political campaign, the abolition of affirmative action was overwhelmingly approved by that state's citizens. I think it was 58% to 42%. We knew looking southward to California that the results would be bad. I mean, the results for diversity would be bad. If you were a UW student uh, in the fall of 1998, just before the passage of the Anti-Affirmative Action Initiative, one of every 11 of your classmates would have been an underrepresented minority. Following year, after the passage of uh, Initiative 200, and, and of course the university acceded to it, it had no choice, only one of every 18 UW freshmen were uh, minorities, by which I mean African Americans, Native Americans, or Hispanic Latinos. So we set out systematically to increase dramatically our uh, outreach to targeted school districts where uh, kids of color were very well represented. We changed the admissions process. First, we have to, had to get rid of race. That was what the voters had said. Uh, but we expanded it to a holistic uh, review of each applicant, including their answers to questions like the following. The University of Washington uh, values or cherishes uh, a, a multicultural uh, environment where all values and peoples are represented. I'm making this up on the spur of the moment, as you can tell. Uh, but it was, something, it was something like that. How would you contribute to uh, such an environment? Of course, you know, white people can contribute to that as well. And then thirdly, we, we, we did something uh, that was a little bit controversial. In concert with private organizations and individuals, we raised financial aid money, back to Bernie's point, that was targeted for racial minorities. I think, I think a public institution can, can do that, or well, cannot do that. Uh, but, but can work with private organizations and institutes. So, so over the next five years, and by the end of which time I was, I was gone from the UW, I was at Rutgers, um, we got the numbers more or less back to where they had been, the numbers of African American, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American students. So on the one hand, this is a story consistent with uh, Molly's, I guess, uh, and perhaps other people in the room agree that you can do without um, using race as a plus factor in admission. Actually, while my evidence to some extent supports that, I don't agree, I don't agree with that. Um, you really ought to have every arrow in your quiver. 
and the ability in concert with such strategies as the ones that were outlined for us this morning, outreach and pipeline development and targeted uh, uh, efforts to uh, persuade admitted students to come, uh, I, I think, I think race-based affirmative action remains very, very important. And I, I urge those of us in the higher education community, as I said in my question a little while ago, to find ways of communicating that to the Supreme Court before they make a, a decision again in Fisher too. I'll probably have more to say on that subject as we go on. So you've begun the conversation about strategies, and I want to look a little further at that, starting through the lens of a dean of admissions at a highly selective institution. We've obviously spent a lot of time and attention, and it takes up most of the air in the room, the mechanism of the admissions decision, how you construct the review of your applicants for admission. And that's certainly important given the uh, past Supreme Court decisions and the pending Fisher II case. But obviously, as the research has shown, there are many, many more strategies. So Jeremiah, if you can discuss, I mean, how you approach the broader goals of diversity through the lens of the admissions office and the campus more broadly. Sure. Um, I mean, one of the things I really found valuable about this morning's report was the emphasis on the idea that there are all of these race neutral and race conscious strategies are working in, con in concert together. And this is not an or mentality that admissions offices hold, but an and and both. And places like Yale and any other institution in this room that is able to <coughs> marshal resources, I'm sure has been putting a lot of those resources towards a whole array of strategies that, depending on how you define it, could be on the spectrum from race neutral to race conscious. And in fact, if you just look at Yale's strategies, we probably spend more um, now on, on what you would classify as race neutral efforts than we do uh, just in terms of our outreach and our recruitment than um, on stuff that really focuses and zeroes in on race. Because our diversity initiatives and our, the way we value diversity and the way we define diversity is so much broader than that. Um, I, just to quickly highlight some of the things that we do, and this is not unique to my specific institution, I know. I wanted to arrange things a little bit like the report did in seasons. I thought that was sort of an interesting organizational device. Um, and uh, the recruitment of students actually could start at any point, but I sort of figured it out. We could start at sort of the, the winter of a student's junior year. Places like Yale and other institutions are doing already very complex outreach targeting based on a student's uh, parental education levels based on their race. An uh, institution like Yale will, spend, will send 300 of its own students back on spring break to targeted high schools. Last year we had 300 Yale students visit over 600 different schools in the country that are specifically identified as places that are non-traditionally sending students to Yale. Um, we, in the summer, spend a lot of time and money tailoring messages specifically to the sort of top 20,000 low-income uh, students in our uh, prospective database. Um, based on an overlap of testing and zip code, we spend uh, postcards about our financial aid policies to them. We, spend, we send a postcard about Yale diversity and student stories to them. We talk to them about fee waivers. We welcome thousands of community-based organizations and diversity programs to our campus in the summer. Um, both hosting them on campus, but also welcoming them through and speaking to them. Um, once the fall starts up, we do a multi-layered outreach strategy that involves partnerships with uh, other institutions. We have a partnership with Harvard and Princeton and the University of Virginia that specifically focuses on diversity, and we travel together as institutions to dozens of cities to talk about our financial aid, to talk about the diversity of our institutions. We go through reams of data. I guess it's not reams anymore. We go through spreadsheet and spreadsheet of data um, to target the specific high schools that my staff will visit. We host a multicultural open house on campus that welcomes over 1,000 students and over 1,000 parents. Um, we create a specific brochure about diversity and uh, disseminate that to specific audiences. Um, in the winter, we have our holistic admissions process. A, 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 a university like Yale employs 26 admissions officers to review over 30,000 applications. We have partnerships with an institution called QuestBridge that does certainly take up plenty of resources um, to identify uh, sort of low-income students with an additional application, an additional application consideration phase. We do put a thumb on the scale 
um, for our students who are first in their families to attend college in our process. And we have also added in the last few years other race neutral contextual factors to our process, whether or not a student goes to a school that is over 40% free and reduced price lunch in its population, whether a student's home zip code is in a low income neighborhood as defined by the American Neighborhood Survey. We have developed relationships with community-based organizations and access organizations to give them the same opportunity to provide our officers feedback as independent schools do in the process. Then we admit a great class of students and we go to the recruitment phase. And again, just to give a little bit more of life to some of the stuff that the research report was showing this morning, we fly in based on a student's income over 300 of our admitted students <laughs> who are on campus recruitment event. Yale pays the bill to fly in hundreds of students to come to our campus before they make a decision. All of our financial aid is based on need, uh, on a student's need. Um, we, our average grant last year for a student receiving financial aid was over $42,000. Um, we have a specific early recruitment process to identify high performing low income students and underrepresented, uh, students underrepresented uh, in higher ed be, uh, because of their race and we give them more, we notify them even earlier than other students. Um, and then once we get them to agree to come to our campus, we have a variety of summer bridge programs which we can sort of transition to the next panel which I won't go into detail with but we actually have uh, invite uh, 46 students to campus to take one of our English courses the summer before um, they matriculate and that's based solely on financial aid award, not on race. Um, we also have an online math program for students to help build up their quantitative reasoning skill skills before they have to come to our campus and take QR courses. And we actually survey all of our incoming freshmen about belongingness um, and sort of get their opinions on diversity on campus and their expectations for the transition before they even come to, uh, to New Haven. All of this is millions of dollars of work um, every single year um, that is spent on these things. Um, and I, I just thought it was important to sort of highlight the fact that institutions um, are investing time, resources uh, in these problems right now and really trying to move the needle in areas that go much broader than what the Supreme Court is currently considering. So I, I think I've spoken long enough, but I just wanted to make sure that we could add a little flavor to some of the stuff that the report was highlighting. So, so, so Mike, I think what you're hearing from us is that there are a wide array of strategies that we can use, and they're not all the same from one institution or one state to another. In the case of the University of North Carolina, we had gear up. Uh, we, had, we were successful in getting the state to enact a need-based student aid program, which had not previously existed. We used volunteers and went into every high school in the state of North Carolina uh, meeting with seniors and helping them. They hadn't filed an application to go to college. We showed them how to do it. We tutored them in submitting uh, the Common App. Um, we engaged them in uh, FAFSA and helped them fill out those forms. Um, and it has made a huge difference. The rate of growth of though that category of students, uh, minority, low income, rural parts of the state, they grew at three times the rate of the traditional college students in North Carolina. So the strategies are different for different environments, but there are strategies. Or Bernie, any, any particular illustrations from your experiences to highlight this question? Well, th th I mean, I think Yale's approach is probably the gold standard. If we could all spend those kinds of resources <laughs> doing it, uh, it, would be, it, would be, it would be great. But I, I think Molly made the point, there are things out there that we can do without affirmative action to enhance the diversity of our institutions. And I think that's, that's where we need to begin to work. We need to be thinking more about new approaches rather than what Justice Kennedy has for breakfast today. He's going to write his opinion. 
There's a question here from the audience and it aligns a little bit with one of them that we were going to ask here is circling back a little bit more to the resource question. There's no, there's no question that higher ed leaders, particularly today, have more financial challenges on their plate perhaps than their predecessors 10 or 20 years ago. Resources have been cut, there's more demands, more expectations. Uh, how do you make the tough decisions about diverting resources to these diversity objectives given the many things that are on your plate? Mike, I think, I, I think leadership is, is extremely important. At a, at a time of constrained resources, it makes a difference if the president, as Molly did and as Bernie did, if the president affirms that diversity is extremely important and, and connects it to the core values of the institution. I, I, I think social justice is absolutely part of the conversation, especially for state universities that have social justice ingrained in them as part of their DNA. But the educational value of diversity is also critical. And the, the fact that, I, as I observed before, research shows everybody gets a better education in a diverse environment, it matters when presidents stand up and say these things. And you know, the left to their own devices, uh, faculty and departments and programs might pursue other goals. And indeed, they do pursue other goals, and rightly so, uh, uh, with uh, you know, the excellence of their particular discipline at the, at the, at the top of mind. But it's really important when the person at the top says, no, diversity matters, social justice matters, the educational excellence brought by a diverse student body uh, matters. I think this is especially important for leaders at selective institutions, and I guess all of us up here uh, represent uh, that, where, uh, as uh, was observed before, students of color and poor students are, st are still badly underrepresented. I think it's particularly important uh, for leaders of public universities. Three of us fall into that category. Uh, selective public universities are sometimes perceived to put the US News and World Report rankings above other things, and, and knowing that average SAT scores uh, plays strongly into the U.S. News and World Report ranking. There's a temptation to downplay uh, diversity and go for increasing the ranking by increasing average SAT scores. A, a, a president, a president can say no to that. A president can make clear, yeah, we're interested in our reputation, of course, but essential to that reputation is the degree to which our, our university is true to its principles regarding social justice and the educational excellence that diversity brings. So I think leadership, there's no substitute for uh, leadership. Um, as I mentioned, UNC, our, our issue was at scale. Uh, they hadn't tried to get a state need-based student aid program. We went about it pretty systematically and were successful. Uh, in order to accommodate the expansion in enrollment growth that we anticipated, we needed to make huge investments in our facilities, in our laboratories, and in our classrooms. And um, I ran it through the legislature without success and then asked them to give us a chance to take it to a vote of the people. And so we then went out to barber shops and uh, stores and um, just all across the state. And the message was, this is for your children and your grandchildren. And we passed a $3.2 billion bond referendum in all 100 counties of North Carolina with three out of four voters supporting it. I mean, these are parts of North Carolina where no one in their family ever went to college but they really believe that it would make a difference in the lives of their kids and their, and their grandkids. So I'd asked earlier, um, your experiences in the states where the use of race and ethnicity was banned or you had to battle back from that, uh, how your commitment uh, was maintained. So I wanna ask a little more directly, how, how do you avoid becoming reticent about the entire notion of considering race and ethnicity the practice in admissions given the scrutiny that this issue has been given. I think about many selective public institutions right now are experiencing, and I think many of you have seen this, concerted efforts on the part of some organizations to try and get students to uh, build class action cases against the institution, look at the admissions records of currently enrolled students to draw some patterns about how they were admitted. This, this is under the microscope, particularly selective public institutions, but Yale's not. How do you not become reticent? Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, at the institutions with which I have been associated, we haven't become reticent. 
um, in, in saying that uh, a diverse student body was essential, and by that we mean including racially and ethnically diverse. In the case of Washington, as I've already recounted, it became illegal to use race as a plus factor in the admissions decision, so of course we stopped doing that, and, and significantly stepped up other forms of recruitment and outreach. I've already described that. At, at Rutgers, uh, where the, in New Jersey, where uh, the use of race as a factor, a plus factor in admissions is still permitted, uh, we had uh, achieved a fairly diverse student body over the decades, but very few of our students of color came from uh, the big cities of the state, not from Newark, Camden, Patterson, Atlantic City, Trenton, and, and so forth, including the cities where our university was located, namely Newark and New Brunswick. So we launched the Rutgers Future Scholars Program, a pipeline program in coordination with the school districts in our four hometowns, three of which are older industrial cities, New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden, uh, identified a cohort of uh, 200 each year. We're now in the seventh or eighth year. Uh, pledged to work with those, identify them when they were finishing seventh grade. Pledged to work with them continuously as they completed high school and made them this promise. If you're admitted to Rutgers and you won't get special admissions consideration, uh, you'll, go for, you'll go for free. Um, it's an expensive program, comparable uh, in, in some ways to what Bernie has described in Florida. Um, but it, it, it has been uh, it, it embraced warmly by the university community, by the political leadership of the state, and by the business leadership of New Jersey. They're, they're not reticent in saying <coughs> diversity matters and even race matters. I think one of the ways to avoid the reticence is to, uh, as Art put earlier, kind of just roll up your sleeves and do some of the institutional groundwork that you need to in response to some of the legal advice. Um, I had a two, I led three conversations this year on campus about the educational benefits of diversity. And the students, um, both students and faculty, the reaction was kind of like, uh, hasn't this question already been decided? Why are we even having this conversation? Like, kind of like, no duh, Dean Quinlan, you know, from the <laughs> students. Um, in fact, they, the students were defining diversity in so many different interesting ways that I certainly can't quantify in my own admissions process. It was kind of dizzying for me to think about how we could even follow the student advice to make them happier. Um, but the faculty were, were really fired up about the issue as well, but only because I think they had to be sort of briefed in the legal landscape because to them it just was so obvious that the diversity that is, is being seen at a place like the compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is so exciting um, that you leave those conversations feeling really um, retrenched in the value of the work that you do and why you know, it's so clear to the people who are in the core of the, you know, in the classrooms and in the residential colleges and in the extracurricular activities that this is one of the best things that they get out of being a student or being a faculty member at Yale that you kind of have to, have to be committed. I, I'm a little bit nervous about what those conversations are going to look like after Fisher II and, you know, if, if us as admissions professionals can't meet the, the desires and preferences of our, of our core constituents. I think ultimately it is um, living up to the values um, and it is determination. If one strategy doesn't work, you find another strategy. Hmm. Um, for example, the uh, Nessie survey has questions on it about how effectively the learning experience is enhanced when there's interaction um, across uh, racial uh, differences. And I would meet with the uh, chancellors um, every year as a part of their, their performance assessment and we would look at the Nessie results as one of the components and if there were areas like this one where a chancellor was not living up to our expectations, um, we applied a little pressure. Um, and I mean, th these are the tools that you have and you have to use them in the right way and for the right reason. I want to open this up for questions. So if you have questions, please come to the microphone. But I'll, I'll start here with one from, the, from our audience online. How important is it for institutions to have diversity in their mission statements? So I alluded to that earlier. I think, it, I think it's central, especially 
at institutions like mine where there has been and will not be any consideration of race in admissions. If an institutional leader is going to allocate resources for diversity, it sure is nice to have it in the mission statement. And now, frankly, if it's not in there, you may have trouble getting it in there. But the second most important piece of that is to make sure your leadership is firmly, and I mean firmly, back in, in back of uh, diversity. But once it's there, you can make institutionally based decisions about how to allocate resources to enhance diversity. Question from the audience. Excellent answer. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Bill Conley. I'm Vice President for Enrollment Management at Bucknell University. Enrollment management has been interchangeably used with admissions this morning. and. Um, and I thought that's interesting because it's been very difficult to come with a, to come to a single definition of what is enrollment management. But uh, Don Hostler in the 80s described it as uh, an enrollment manager operates at the nexus of prestige, access, and net tuition revenue. <laughs> <laughs> and so I throw to my esteemed leaders at the panel, um, we all know those levers don't move in the same direction. And um, in a way, uh, Syracuse University had, you know, um, moved very aggressively years ago on the access and found the prestige in, in the U.S. News and World Report going down and issues of net tuition revenue. So how do you help on your campuses the enrollment management uh, function to successfully navigate those three um, almost mutually exclusive agenda yeah. items. I mean, I think that it's uh, a good question, Bill. I think it all comes down to the leadership priorities that are set from the president. I mean, it, I think it, it's, it, as you said, it's very clearly a triangle. And what shape the triangle is, if it's an isosceles triangle or an equilateral triangle or a, <coughs> something that doesn't really even resemble a triangle um, would, uh, would be, you know, something that you as an enrollment leader need to advocate for, but that really needs to come down from the president on high because there are going to be so many different people and, and different vice presidents who are going to care about the different sides of that triangle to differing extents. I mean, obviously, your C the institution CFO is going to care about one, and your institution's chief marketing officer is going to care about another. Um, and if there's a chief diversity officer, they're going to care about the third. So you're going to have to be the person who's going to try and navigate that. And it's Im virtually impossible to navigate that, in my perspective, unless you really clearly understand where the president falls in that equation. Um, because ultimately, if I ever have any issues with some of the results, I just know that my, you know, my, my mission in, is, is in line with what the president wants to do, and that's how we're going to sort of navigate that. I know that that's not a, a, a very profound answer, but I think it's frankly probably the most realistic. I don't know if anyone has any other things. You, I'm the only one who hasn't actually been a president in this, on this <laughs> you know, so I'd rather have. I've already spoken to the matter of presidential leadership, uh, so I'll just concur with what uh, Jeremiah said. <clears throat> uh, the, the environment, in the environment at Rutgers, it was fortunate, uh, perhaps unlike North Carolina, is a long tradition of need-based financial aid from the state and in addition, uh, every time the uh, Board of Governors raised tuition, and unfortunately they've raised tuition a good deal in the last decade or so, a significant portion of it was set aside, of the new tuition revenue, was set aside for need-based financial aid. As a result, uh, Rutgers is able, in, in, in coordination with the federal government and the state government, to assure that about 80 percent of our students ha altogether have, have financial aid. And uh, it's not enough. There, there are some middle class students in particular ineligible for Pell Grants. And even between the state support and the institutional support, it, it's, a, it's a real stretch for their family. But um, uh, it, it, institutional commitment and leadership are essential to doing even that much. I was going to say some of the work of Caroline Hoxby at Stanford would suggest that perhaps highly selective institutions aren't finding all of the uh, high achieving, low income unrepresented students as part of their pool. So that might be another strategy to try and improve those metrics, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive ones. Next question. Uh, good morning. Joy Dingle, uh, 
K-16 consultant with a achieving equality. Um, the panel touched a bit on K-12 on K outreach, um, and I, I wanted to hear thoughts on providing incentives to do that outreach even earlier, especially in underserved communities. And then on uh, something that hasn't been mentioned is the role of uh, private industry taking a lot more interest in its future workforce, and how can there be more creative ways to create uh, grants as a way of supplementing uh, needs-based aid? So let me start this one. I, I think it is uh, critically important to take advantage of the opportunity before kids graduate from high school. Um, and there, there are lots of ways of doing it. Um, one example that comes to my mind, when I was in Arizona, we uh, supported a summer bridge program that was for Hispanic mothers and daughters. And um, it was smashingly successful. And one of the students, I brought her to the legislature. And when she stood there before the legislature and said, as a result of this bridge program, she knew that college was possible for her. And she said, you know, I just realized I am smart. Well, you could have heard a pin drop in that <laughs> legislature when this. So I do believe that reaching out to students uh, before they complete high school and help them think about college as a possibility is one of the most important tools. So I, I must tell you that when you look at the allocation of resources, it's difficult to justify putting resources at lower than K through 12 simply because we don't have them. And it's been my uh, observation that the focus needs to be on uh, the young people in high school who do want to graduate and making sure that they understand that there is a chance for them to go to a highly selective institution. Uh, Yale's making sure that people fully understand their financial aid policies is a very good strategy to make that happen. In our case, we have to make sure that the, uh, the Opportunity Scholarship Program is fully understood in the high schools. And the best source of that for us has been the guidance counselors. So even though you have a student who is working two or three jobs, supporting their family, and achieving at a high level in high school, remember, there's no cut on admissions at the University of Florida. Everyone meets the same admissions bar but they have no way of paying for a University of Florida uh, matriculation. To know that there is a scholarship, that if they get in, they have a probability that they can go for free, really does make a difference. And so that's where we're putting our effort right now in the spreading the word, not going below K through 12 to make that happen. Last year, when I looked at the pool, we had an additional 900 students admitted to the University of Florida for whom I didn't have money to pay for their opportunity scholarship. So for me, right now, it's all about financial aid. Let me take a question from the virtual audience, and then I'll come to you. Um, how do you respond to news that institutions are beginning to pull back from commitments to diversity in the form of the chief diversity officer? Recently, a prominent institution rolled the job to the provost's office. What, what message does that send? Well, if it were true, uh, it would send a, a very bad message. I think it's, this is uh, exactly not the time to do that. They're converging forces, imperiling our ability to uh, bring a diverse student body to our institutions, as I summarized before. And, uh, the creation rather than the disestablishment of institutional diversity officers is, is essential. I, I, most of the colleges and universities with which I'm familiar are not going in that unfortunate direction. But if they are, it is indeed unfortunate. Yeah, I would agree, it's particularly because something we haven't really touched on is, is feeling like the work that needs to be done is in diversifying our faculties is so tremendous. And without having that level of officer to work on that issue. You can have the enrollment manager or the admissions dean work on the student input issue um, 
to, you know, for years, and we have been working on it for years, but, you know, what do we hear from our students when we bring them to our campus is they're looking for faculty and staff and mentors that reflect the diversity of our student body. And we need people at that level to work on those issues as well. Yes, question from the audience. Uh, ben Reese, I'm Vice President for Institutional Equity at Duke University, the Chief Diversity Officer, and President of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. You should answer the question. <laughs> well. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> Perfect. So let, this wasn't my question, but let me just amplify your, your, your comment. Um, I noted in an online publication a couple of days ago in response to uh, one of our universities uh, eliminating the chief diversity officer, officer position that um, it's such a critical leadership position, having someone 24 hours a day working on diversity with the expertise to work with other senior leaderships, senior leadership on an issue that is it's kind of unthinkable, particularly in the context of what's happening nationally, to think about eliminating the position. You know, and I further commented that I don't think any institution would merge the chief financial officer with the provost, thinking that the provost could, you know, be the chief financial officer along with being the chief academic person. So um, I, I just couldn't help but comment on that. But my question was, uh, and it's really asking for a comment from uh, the experts there, uh, we've kind of merged in our, in our discourse the concept of diversity and race. Uh, the Supreme Court is dealing pretty directly with the issue of race, not so much directly with the issue of diversity. There are leaders who are really strong component, uh, proponents of diversity, but they minimize race and then there are leaders who are strongly in favor of diver diversity, and race is a significant part of the way they conceptualize and practice diversity. So our, our discourse and I think our, our thinking kind of conflates the broad issue of diversity with the issue of race. So I wonder if you could comment in terms of leadership, um, just how do we figure that out? How do we uh, maintain an appropriate focus on race while we talk about the broader, critically important concept of diversity? Well, um, as, a, as a historian, uh, I'll observe that when the whole diversity conversation emerged back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, although we were slow to begin to use that word, it was about race. It was about a moment in time when brave African American students and campuses all across our country uh, took over buildings and uh, made, made demands and, and made clear that their institutions were not representing their communities and their selves. There's little facu few faculty that looked like them. There was nothing in the curriculum that reflected their, when, when, when we, and, and they succeeded. They, they succeeded more than they ever could have dreamed they would uh, to the point where diversity now means many more things than, but it, its origins lie in race and the racial component of it is critically important. I would be very unhappy to see affirmative action struck down. The, the inability, henceforth, the inability to use race as a plus factor in admissions. I'd be, I'd be, I would be wary of leaders who disguise any interest in race, race by talking just about diversity, socioeconomic diversity. But the, the origins of what we mean by diversity in America lie in race, and that's still that remains a critical component of it. Any other thoughts on that question? Let's take the luxury here, since we don't have a question, um, an opportunity to wrap up a little. Oh, I'm sorry, there, you did have some, one yes. more question. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Kaselica. I'm from Myona College, and Molly, I'm very proud to say a, a member of the uh, ACA Fellows class from 2013-2014. It's good to see you again. Um, I want to uh, underscore a couple points that were made. First off, I appreciate so much uh, the ideas on leadership and the importance of leadership as uh, a symbolic and systemic message about the importance of diversity and the various ways that you've suggested leaders can do that. Um, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the prior gentleman's point about having uh, chief diversity officers, and, and I would extend his ideas a bit by saying that I think in addition to having one or, or more diversity officers, 
depending on the size of the institution, that that individual be elevated to the level of a cabinet position. Because I think that there's certain crucial symbolic messages that are made when that sort of decision is implemented. That's the first point. And the second is uh, amplifying the, the examples you've raised about uh, putting money where your mouth is. So for example, you've talked about, for example, at Yale, how you invested in, in money and all of these uh, admission strategies. One other point I think is crucial that as a follow-up to getting diversity and multiculturalism in, in the mission statement, uh, as Bernie was accentuating, that that be reflected in the money uh, and how it's allocated in strategic plans. Because I have seen institutions where they pay tremendous lip service to diversity, and then you'll look at a strategic plan, and there's not money in the plan that's diverted towards uh, diversity initiatives. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. I'm looking at that clock, which is a little bit ahead. Does everybody agree? Okay. Um, combining a little bit from one that's asked here and one that we had talked about, maybe to close here, it, it's the question about messaging and advocating for diversity. Um, you know, what are your recommendations for getting institutional leaders on board to advocate for diversity publicly or privately? Sort of the question of, you know, what are the key messages that our institutional leaders can have to their communities or public broadly? Uh, about diversity. So I, I wanted to comment on the holistic admissions process, which is certainly one of the strategies that's out there. I think that is a very important strategy for those of us who live without affirmative action and for those of you who will. And um, I think we should continue to broaden the definition of diversity without neglecting race, which is the anchor that starts this thing. But the broader our definition of diversity, the more inclusive we can be in our admissions process and the more we can really make the educational experience one at the collegiate level that really does practice what we say we preach. And my last point that we should be emphasizing everywhere we go to everyone we speak to is we need more need-based financial aid. Don't. <laughs> end every conversation with that um, I think that uh, the specific the specific message will be different depending on your institution but I think making sure that the president is using his or her vehicle for that messaging to highlight specific diversity um, uh, the president at Yale in the last two years has included, has done an entire freshman address, which is sort of an annual high profile moment for the president to his first, as president, his first address was focused on the American dream, his uh, family's story about coming to the United States, and then also about the value of diversity. Um, and all, not only having it on campus, but having discussions about it. And you wouldn't believe the legs that that has had on our campus with alumni, with faculty, with students. Um, sometimes, he, in some ways, he's been a little too successful, and our students have agitated for a variety of things, invoking our president's <laughs> remarks that then the president wants me to deal with. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but I'm so glad that he did that. Um, and then even recently, you know, our president sends out a um, every other week message to the entire campus community, and he highlighted the top 10 things that he was sort of, I mean, I don't know how, I don't remember how he characterized it, but it was essentially the top 10 highlight news stories that you should be, uh, you should read about as we come to the close of the academic year. And number nine, in no order of importance, and number nine was about some of the diversity parameter, uh, goals that we had met or exceeded with undergraduate admissions. And it was great because number nine was right above, it was the second one, it was above the fold. Everyone who was reading the email would read it. Um, and I had nothing to do with this. The president's office came to me for this communication. Um, but it just was really, again, something that I could already see lots of people emailing me referring to the article that was 
we did because the president wanted to feature this. So just being able to put the message in the right institution-specific places, I think, gets has so much um, has so much power. And then also to help you, we need more knee-based financial aid. <laughs> so I'll end, I'll end with that. Unanimity. Yeah, unanimity. Yeah. Last question. My name is Luke Hartman. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment at Eastern Mennonite University, a small private Christian liberal arts college in Virginia that was in the news uh, yesterday in Inside Higher Ed for our change in hiring policy. With that being said, uh, my question is how do you see technology harming or enhancing the diversity efforts of the academy, um, especially as more online courses, uh, hybrid courses are being created uh, in the name of accessibility, but then it kind of runs counter in, uh, intuitive to the benefits of diversity with an on-campus experience. Interesting question. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I guess I'll start don't, not answering your full question, um, but to go back to Bill's question about the sort of conflicting priorities of an enrollment manager. And I think one of the issues is one of the reasons the triangle is moving a little bit more towards the net tuition revenue side of things is because of the rising cost of higher education. And I don't have the answers, and no one I think has struck the answer yet, but I do think, I hope, that technology can eventually be one part of the solution that can help deal with the broader cost issues in higher education, which is the topic for another gathering, um, to, that could then help balance the triangle in a way that we can focus a little bit more on access and less on net tuition revenue. Um, and you know, I'm very fortunate to be at a place that net tuition revenue doesn't really have a, doesn't have a driving factor in our decision-making processes. Um, but I do really value your, the point about how technology then can't just become a, a replacement for the on-campus experience if we are articulating how valuable that having diversity is. So I think that's going to be a fine line to walk, but I think it's one we have to walk because I think we need to be able to deal with some of the structural cost issues that are really harming some of our access goals at institutions. So I think there's a lot of adaptation that we're going to be faced with in the very near future. And technology and artificial intelligence and cognitive science hold a lot of potential to make it possible for individual learning to be effective. Not one size or one approach fits all. Uh, but we're also looking at a future in which more and more of the college students will not be 18 to 22 or even to 28, uh, where individuals will need to have opportunities to raise their knowledge and skill to keep the job they have or to get a better job. And they're juggling those responsibilities with family responsibilities. And the technology provides opportunities for individuals on their own time to raise their skill level. On that very positive note, uh, I want to thank our panel for your tremendous insights into this leadership question about higher education and diversity. Please thank our panel.